The charm quirk is nonsense. That's the topic of today's video. And as I've talked about in other videos, if you look at the elementary particle table and look at, well, what particles could I eliminate to try to simplify things, we can take our pick. And some are more obvious than others. But I'll start with charm quirk among the quirks. And the reason for that will become apparent. Now first I want to say if you're a real scientist and you're doing particle theory, you must account for two things. The masses and the decay products. The quark theory does neither very well. But the quark theory does have a mass estimate. Now, if you're not familiar with the charm quarks, there's some particles, or residences, as I prefer to call them, that are supposed to contain the charm quark. And they're the D mesons and the J psi mesons, and also the charmed baryons. And the estimate I mentioned is 1,275 MeV per T squared plus 25 minus 35. So it's not known very accurately. And of course the reason it's not known ac very accurately is because it's not a stable particle. Charm quarks have never been observed on their own. So they have to determine what the mass is by subtracting it from other masses. And so they get estimates like a high of uh, 1348 or 1360 and low around 1000. So there's a wide range and there's in some studies thought to be an even higher range. And so the mass isn't known very precisely. If it was a stable free particle, we'd probably know it to five decimal places, but we don't. Now to really understand what the charm quark really is, we need to go back to the positronium solutions, the relativistic positronium solutions that were initially discovered by Milne and then rediscovered by Feynman and Sternglass and refined by Brown. And what they basically found out is if you take an electron and positron pair, positronium, there's two solutions. There's one that's non-relativistic, that's well known, but there's a relativistic one at higher velocity where you get much higher energies. And what Sternglass found out is the total energy for two for the pair is around 140 MeV or 70 MeV per, per particle, which actually breaks down to the mass of the electron divided by the fine structure constant or 137 times the mass of the electron, gives you approximately 70. Now, Brown redid this solution and he found out the quantizations at 35 MeV per, per C squared, which is the mass of the electron divided by two times the fine structure constant. And so we find that these terms show up because all of the heavier particles are quantized based on the mass of the electron divided by two times fine structure constant, or one times. Some, some particles have, are double. Then the important thing to note is that this solution does not only apply to a single electron orbiting a single positron, but if you have groups of electrons and groups of pos positrons, you get a multiple and you get you still get a solution and so what we find is that two pions form a kaon and two kaons form a d meson and this goes back to looking at the actual decay products if you look at the decay products in in depth and you have to unscramble them because some are quite complicated but systematically, you see the D meson has two kaons in all the groups. The J psi mesons 
have 4 k ohms, and the charm baryons have 2 k ohms. And that's where we start to see a pattern emerging from the decay products. And if you have a pion, a kaon made of two pions, each pion has three electrons and orbiting an electron, so they have seven together. So 14 times 35 is 490.18 MeV per C squared. And 14 times 70, further rounding off, is 980.35 MeV per C squared. So these are the orbital energies that are possible when you have two kaons in orbit. And we can apply this real quickly and say, well, we know the omega decays to four pions, and so it looks like it contains two low energy kaons. And if we take the mass, 782.66 MeV per C squared, and 490.18 MeV per C squared, we get a total of 1,272.84 MeV per C squared, which is the mass of the charm quark. So, the charm quark is basically a relativistic omega meson. That's all it is. It's a pair of kaons that are orbiting relativistically and you get some additional energy. Now I mentioned that there are low energy kaons and that comes about because some kaons have a pion orbited by a pion and some have two pions orbiting each other. And when you only have one in orbit you get a mass in the range of 384 to 398 MeV per C squared. And there's a system for whether it's the lower energy range or the higher energy range, but I won't try to explain it here. And then if you have two orbiting around an electron, you get a mass of 493.677 because that's a normal charge K on mass. For the lower energy K on, I use the term KD. And so if you have an electron, two kD kaons, and the 980.35 MeV per C squared, the higher energy orbit, you have 1,775.8 MeV per C squared, which is the mass of the tau particle. And I did another video on how the tau particle is not elementary because it's a pair of kaons. And then if you take an electron, a KD, and a K, it's slightly more massive, 1872.0, which is your regular D meson. Then if you take an E and two Ks, then you get a mass of 1968.2, which is almost exactly the measured mass of the strange D meson. And it's exactly what it decays to. Then if we take a step back and we look at the K star 892, which is a little more massive than the omega, but also decays to four pi ions or two k ions in some cases, and at 490 you get 1382 MeV, which can give you a reason why someone might measure 1348 or 1360, because there are variations that are going to give you a different mass. And the range of the kaon, the KD kaon mass in the various particles that it's part of, actually gives you somewhat of a range of plus or minus 10 to 20 MeV. So it's not a big surprise that you see a range, but because there's different uh, magnetic effects going on and other effects going on within the orbital solutions. And if you account for all those effects, that gives you a slightly different mass than the perfectly calculated one 
based on the ME over 2 alpha equation. And so I put up here, you can actually do, look at all the D mesons and calculate their components and their energy and get a very close match to the mass. And then we can go on to the baryons and do the same thing. Except here we have a proton orbited by two kaons, which gives us, at 490 MeV, gives us a mass at 2286.5, which is the lambda baryon. Then we add a pion, and we get the sigma. Add two pions in a certain type of orbit, we get the chi. Then if we have a chi orbited by two kaons, we get the omega. And once again, we can do this with every single charm baryon. And I have in my papers, and I'll link both the meson and baryon papers below. And you get the answers. Then we can go to the JSI, all the charmonium ones, the ones that are supposed to have two charm baryons in them. Well, if it has two charm baryons, it has four kaons. And guess what? They predominantly decay to four kaons, and the mass of the J psi looks like a pion, two kaons in their normal form, not, not relativistic, and the strange D meson, which means two kaons in a relativistic orbit. So, because it has four kaons, it gives the appearance of uh, having two charm baryons. So, <clears throat> so the physicists didn't really miss that badly, except that they didn't need to substitute charm baryons for two kaons. They could just say two kaons and just leave it at that, because then they can get the mass and the decay products to match up, which is what I did when I published my onium theory and particles. Well, as you can probably guess, the beauty or bottom quark is going to be 2D mesons. And this difference in energy between the KB and the K, or the orbital energy of a pion, which is what that is, is around 100 MeV per C squared, which is the mass of the strange quark. But I'll do other videos on those to talk about that in more detail. Well, I hope you liked this video. And if you do, please like it, share it with your physicist friends, subscribe for more. Like I said, I've got more on quarks and many other problems with physics. And then if you'd like to read about it, you could, you could buy a copy of my book, Goodbye Quarks, The Onion Theory. Or if you want to read about my quantum field theory research, you can buy those books too. And buying a book helps me in my retirement. So I appreciate it. And you can learn a lot more details about what's going on. Like I said, I'll link some papers below as well. So thanks for watching.